Hi, everybody, and welcome to U.S. Farm Report. Our U.S. Farm Report crew has just completed an extensive field trip through portions of the Midwest, East, Northeast, and South. The scenes you're now watching were filmed in New Jersey, and this week's show will acquaint you with dairying and other types of agriculture in the states of New Jersey and Maine. On future shows, we will present on-the-scene farm reports from Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, the New England states, as well as Virginia and North and South Carolina. New Jersey is indeed the garden state agriculturally, famous for its canning crops such as tomatoes, string beans, cucumbers, peppers, asparagus, sweet corn, and many others. And the garden state is proud of its outstanding dairy production and boastful of talented dairy farmers like Hiram Strang. Hiram, I want you to know how very much we with U.S. Farm Report appreciate the fact that uh, you've taken about two days of your time to show us around uh, this part of New Jersey. We appreciate it very much. This is fine farming country through here. Yeah, we think so, anyhow. You know, on this tour, uh, we have been through a number of states. We started uh, through Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and worked on up into New England, and now back to New Jersey. And I must say that outside of Illinois, the crops uh, through this part of New Jersey look the very best. It's been a good year, evidently. Yeah, we've had a, a wonderful year as far as rainfall goes and, and whatnot. We had an awful late spring. We didn't get anything done in April. We had so much water. Mm -hmm. But since then, it's been a it's been a wonderful year. We've had a nice weather to get our hay and a nice lot of rain to grow the crops. You uh, and your sons, Warren and Lee, have a family business going here. Uh, you all farm together, don't you? That's right. Yeah, it's a three-way setup, and uh, we all chip in and work together and try to do everything together. Well, now, how widespread uh, is your operation? Uh, well, our uh, farm here in Woodstown and the one in Shirley is about nine miles apart. Mm -hmm. uh, All together, we're operating between six and 700 acres. Yeah. And, uh, of course, it's all dairy and grain. And we grow everything for the cows that uh, we grow is fed to the cows, practically. Yeah. We have to buy some grain. But uh, the most of it we raise ourselves. Well, now, Warren and his family live here uh, at the Woodstown farm. Yeah, they live here where the dairy is. Uh, and uh, Lee, I guess, uh, then lives at Shirley. He lives on the Shirley right. farm, the home farm. How many grandchildren do you have, Hiram? I have eight. Uh, five grandsons and three granddaughters. Well, I would presume that uh, it's a real pleasure to you to, to see your two sons involved uh, in the farm. And uh, all three of you then can have some good outlook in terms of the farm eventually one day going on to these uh, five boys, these grandchildren. Well, we're kind of looking forward to it anyhow. I hope they see fit to, uh, to become farmers. Of course, nowadays it becomes a matter of whether or not you can make a living on the farm, doesn't it? That's, uh, that's correct. Uh, I don't know if there will... There's work enough for all of them, but I don't know if there'll be money enough for all yeah. of them or not. <laughs> Hiram, what is the size of your milk herd? Uh, we're operating uh, with about uh, 250 head of uh, dairy milking cattle and dry cattle together, and we have about 150 head of heifers and steers. We have a few steers. We raise yeah. our own steers for our own meat. Well, now, in this pasture down to the left, uh, what are these cows? Are these dry cows? They're dry cows, and uh, they're down there. They're resting pretty easy right now. I believe they've had enough to eat. And <laughs> those birds, uh, there's a bird that come in here a couple of years ago, and they seem to like the flies on the cows, and the cows don't mind them at all. Uh, they, we noticed, uh, although our cameras unfortunately didn't catch the act, that uh, some of these birds actually get right on the backs of these cows to get the flies. Yeah, they sit on the back and pick, pick the flies right yeah. off the cattle. Well, now, you have some bulls in the, with these dry cows, don't you? Yeah, we have them in there. Uh, we do use them uh, later on this fall and winter, but uh, the two of them are Hol Holsteins, mm -hmm. purebreds. Uh, one of them is from one of our good cows, and uh, one of them is one we bought about a year ago. 
And then the white face bull we use for breeding heifers with. I want to get back to uh, your bulls uh, and the subject of artificial insemination in a minute, but over across the fence in the pasture next to where we've been looking, uh, this is your milking herd at the present time, isn't it? That's right. That's, uh, they're all the milk cows that's in that field. Uh, Warren, I understand, uh, has one cow in there that is a real dandy in terms of daily production. Yeah, well, he was, he's was he been trying to get 100 pounds out of her, but the weather got awful hot, and I don't think he quite made it. I think he got her to around 96 pounds. Yeah. It, uh, a lot of farmers has them that makes 100 pounds, but we don't uh, feed him and take that much individual care of them. We were amazed, really, to see how calm and contented uh, these cows are. They, they, they really look like uh, they're cows that have been... Uh, raised properly in a proper climate. Would you say that this is true? Uh, I think so, because the way we raise them, we start raising them uh, in the small stalls, and we feed them by hand out of the bucket, and they're just pets right on through. Mm -hmm. And uh, once in a while, we get one that gets a little nervy, but uh, most of them is very quiet. What is your uh, milk production total at the present time, Hiram? Uh, per cow, uh, I don't know. We haven't DHI tested since uh, 1966, but uh, we have the weigh jars in the parlor, and we can tell what each cow is giving. And the herd average from our milk production that's sent into the plant, uh, I would say, runs around 13, 14 thousand a year mm -hmm. per cow, and probably uh, 450 to 475 pound of fat. That's uh, not exact figures, but that's our only thing we have to go by now. Yeah. How long would you say it's taken you to build this herd up to the quality that it possesses at this time? Well, we started with purebreds back in the 40s. So, uh, therefore, I would say we've been working on this herd for about 20 to 25 years. Mm -hmm. and of course, for a good many years, we only had about 40 or 50 head of, of milk cows. and. Uh, we had uh, pretty much all purebreds at that time, and uh, we have been uh, breeding and uh, whatnot, but we don't have too many purebreds. The help got bad short a few years ago, and we just didn't have time to go into all of that, but they are all from purebred cattle. Well, Hiram, now I know that uh, you employ artificial insemination with your herd, but you told me earlier that uh, there are some weaknesses and negatives to it. Well, uh, some of the artificial heifers, we find that uh, their udders and their hind legs don't hold up like I would like to see the Holstein cattle hold up because I've bred for 25 years and most of that we've used our own bulls and I always went for a good uh, top line and a good udder and a good straight hind leg and uh, some of the artificial uh, boys haven't push that too much, and we feel as if that's one of their weakness in mm -hmm. some of the artificial breeding, although they have helped the production an awful lot. Well, now, about this uh, one bull you have, or had, this bull you told me has been dead for, what, three years? Three years, and yeah. And yet uh, you are still using the semen from we that still, bull. We still have semen from him that we're using ourselves, and uh, it's uh, he's a son of the West Leader bull, that great West Leader bull out in the Midwest a few years ago. We don't hear so much about him now because he's gone, but he has a lot of sons and grandsons and and daughters all over the world, I guess. And uh, and then we got quite a bit of this Lucifer blood, which was a great blood uh, some 15, 20 years ago in mm -hmm. Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, the main blood that our herd is built up from is that Lucifer and the West Leader blood. Now, you have some real good-looking pasture out here, and uh, you put these cows out to pasture in good weather. And you told me that the weather here holds pretty good uh, up through uh, the last of November, early December, right? Well, they'll be out uh, in the field till that time, uh -huh. but uh, there's not too much pasture after we might, probably October. Yeah. But uh, it's more of an exercise lot than it is a pasture. Right. Well, now, in bad weather, how do you handle them? Uh, we've all set up with free stalls. We have two big barns with free stalls in. Mm -hmm. 
and something over 200 free stalls for the milk cattle. The dry cattle is still using a loaf and shed. I see. They're in a loaf and shed, but the milk cattle has free stalls. Well, now, tell us about your feeding system for this herd, Hiram. Well, uh, our program has been for the last few years that we have used corn silage. Uh, we've, we never miss a day from one year to another, but what we don't feed so corn silage. Now, in the spring, we feed corn silage once a day. We start off green chopping rye once a day. Mm -hmm. And we go from rye into barley and barley into wheat and wheat into alfalfa hay. And today we've quit green chopping alfalfa hay and going into green chopping corn twice a day. Well now, this uh, chopper of yours really does a great job of chopping this green corn. And uh, it looks to me like this would be a most palatable feed for those cows. They like it, don't they? Yeah, it is. And uh, the farmers have tried all kinds of silage, and there's never anything come up to corn. Mm -hmm. Good corn silage yet. Well, now, Hiram, after the corn is chopped by the chopper and, uh, of course, blown right on into the wagon, uh, how is it handled from there? Well, it's uh, when we green chop direct from the field and feed into bunker, we... Uh, feed the wet burrage grains that we get from the brewery. It's a waste from the beer. And uh, we dump about two to three ton of that right onto the corn silage and then run it out into the long bunk feeder that we have set up on the hill out in the field. Yeah. And that's about the easiest way and the least handling and manpower that we can get away with. This, uh, this mash from the brewery, I understand that uh, after they get through with it, and take from it what they need for uh, brewing beer, that it still leaves most all of the nutrients within the grains. Yeah, there's, uh, there's a good part of it in there. It, uh, it really helps. About two years ago, we quit feeding it, and uh, we just couldn't get milk production like we did with it, so yeah. we went back to feeding it again. You don't suppose that has anything to do with the fact that you have a herd of happy cows, do you? Well, it could. <laughs> it could have. <laughs> you know, we noticed... Uh, as uh, Warren was uh, chopping corn, that uh, there's a lot of cane mixed in your corn. What's the purpose of this, Hiram? Well, uh, we call it a uh, silo maker. It's, uh, it's a special seed for the plant with corn. It uh, is supposed to sweeten up your silage and whatnot for your... We ha had quite a bit of trouble with cows with a uh, lack of sugar. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's the reason we, we put it in there. And we have used it for several years now, and we have had very little trouble with our cattle since then. And I think uh, looking at the cattle, maybe you can kind of tell that they're getting something what oh, they want. I think that are. sugar is helping a lot. Uh, some of the ears of corn have been pretty severely damaged, Hiram. What's causing that? Oh, that's the blackbirds. We had to have a lot of blackbird trouble. We're only about eight to nine miles from the Delaware River, and they have an awful lot of blackbirds down there, and they come in on this corn when it's in the milk, and they do damage it a lot. They take as much as sometimes as 75% of it. Is that right? And it, uh, it really hurts. We've got about 150 acres of corn here, and it uh, can hurt that corn from 50 to 75 bushel of the acre. Anything that you can do um, about it? Well, we run around with the guns and shoot and scare them out, yeah. and it, it helps some, but uh, they do do a lot of damage. In the uh, wintertime, in bad weather, uh, you do your bunk feeding, and uh, you're automated, as I understand it, out of your silos to these bunks. Would you uh, tell us how this works? Yeah, well, the bunker has a, uh, the silo has an unloader in it, and, of course, that runs it down into another auger, and that runs it into the other feeders that runs into the cattle. We have two feeders that's 100 foot long each, and the cattle eat from each side of them, and the dry cattle feeder is 60 foot long, and they can eat from each side of that. So that uh, dry cattle feeder, by the way, is kind of unique, isn't it? I, I don't know that I've seen one like that before. Is this your own idea? Well, that's our own idea. I mean, the boys built it uh, a little over a year ago uh, so we could run silage right out of the wagon into it and also feed hay. Uh, we have a hay rack built over it, and it's side drafted, as you may call it, so that uh, we can run the bunk wagon right down and run the silage into it. Yeah. Tell us about your milking parlor. How big is it and what type is it? 
Uh, milking parlor is a uh, what we call a double eight, uh, eight on a side. Uh, we have we milk eight cows to a time, and the other eight is being put in and getting ready and checked and whatnot and fed. And when the milkers come off of the eight on one side, they go on the other side. And we also have the way jars that calibrates each cow's milk and tells us just what she gives right to the ounce. And that in turn tells you how much to feed her that, while she is being milked. That's right. right. She is fed according to what milk she gets. Yeah. Now, in all of our travels around the northeastern part of the country that is so predominantly dairy country, uh, yours of all operations has the biggest tank capacity. How many tanks uh, do you have and what capacity are they? Uh, the uh, two of the tanks are. Uh, what do we call the 80 can tank and the other one is a 40 can tank a uh, can is what 10 gallon that's 10 gallons so you're talking about 800 uh, uh, gallon tanks two of them that's right and a 400 gallon yeah. tank mm -hmm. is this going to hold you or are you going to grow into something bigger yet well we have another 80 can tank the same as the two that is in there now in the shed that uh, we will be putting in there in the next few months yeah. uh, tell me a little bit about the uh, this farm here at uh, Woodstown, the history of it. Well, it uh, I bought the farm in 1950 and had been in the Hackett name for about 250 years. And uh, in 19, I suppose about 19 or 1861, the house, this house was built by the three brothers and there was two years building it. How come it took them so long? Well, they had a little trouble, I guess. Uh, between themselves, the family troubles probably, uh -huh. and they couldn't seem to see eye to eye, but uh, <laughs> they finally, the next year, they finished it up, and I think it was finished in, in 1862. Just uh, as a point of interest, what were your taxes on this uh, farm uh, in 1950, 51? Uh, in 1950, the taxes, the first year was $246. Uh, last year of 1969, the taxes, was thirty-eight hundred and seventy-eight dollars. Unbelievable, but it's uh, happened. That's what's it? happened in the state of New Jersey. The, the taxes is just going to push the farms out. Yeah. Uh, how long have you been a member of NFO, Hiram? Uh, ever since they started in New Jersey. When which, did uh, they charter this area? Uh, we chartered this area in May of 1964, yeah. and uh, it's going on seven years now. And, uh, so I've been a member, and they threw me in as president of NFO, and I can't get out of it. <laughs> That's usually the case. Yeah. You get a good horse, and yeah. uh, you just keep working him, don't you? Well, we're, we're working for a good thing. That's, yes, That's the main thing. Yes. Well, now, I presume that uh, through the past six years, you've seen a great deal of change in general attitude toward NFO through this area. Yeah, we've seen an awful lot of change because... Uh, Six years ago, uh, my neighbors wouldn't hardly speak to me. Now they will. And uh, they've uh, accepted the NFO very well. I'm very well pleased with how they have took on and, uh, and went along with us. Farmers that we didn't think ever would is going along wonderful. Membership on the increase? Uh, yeah, as far as membership goes, we here in South Jersey, uh, the first two years, we just about signed up everybody that was possible to mm -hmm. sign up. Mm -hmm. We got a, had a good membership. Of course, uh, we're small here in New Jersey, but uh, we're, uh, I tell them we're small but mighty. Yeah. And uh, we had a very good uh, reception of the dumping action when we had the milk dumping action here in South Jersey. Uh, there were several hundred cans of milk dumped every day mm -hmm. and for 15 days straight, and the boys run along wonderful, and it's done an awful lot of good. Through the past six years for the dairymen of this area, Hiram, have there been some uh, marketing successes on NFO's part? Uh, yes, I think there has been. Ever since the dumping action, I think the prices, of course, no farmer ever knew the price of milk to go up the 1st of May before. Uh, until we had our dumping action in 67, and the price did go up the 1st of May. Uh, they took off, the 1st of April, they took off 40 cents a hundred. Uh, and the 1st of May, they give us the 40 cents back plus, 
I think it was 28 cents more. I think we got 68 cents a hundred increase the first day of May uh, after the dumping action. And there has been several increases, and I believe out in the Midwest the same thing has happened out there. And it's it's done a lot of good, and I think the boys is really looking up the NFL for to get this job done. Don Randall, his wife, and their three children live in a very old but spacious and comfortable farmhouse west of Charleston, Maine, which is near Bangor, Maine. Don farms 150 acres, has 160 head of cattle, and milks 110 cows. His setup for his cow herd is the freestall confinement type. Don is NFO president in Penobscot County, Maine. He's a native of this part of the country, having been born and reared on the farm he now owns. I visited with Don about farming in his state. In what county uh, are we at this time? Penobscot County. And how many counties are there in the state? 16. Now, NFO has been doing well through the state of Maine, right? Right. Uh, how many counties of the 16 are chartered at this time, Don? We have... Uh... I believe 14 chartered counties, and the other two were about ready to be chartered. Uh, you think that this will happen in the very near future? I think I'm being chartered by fall. Mm -hmm. What uh, predominates through Maine agriculturally, Don? We do know that it's an agri or that it's a, a dairy state, as is so much of New England. But uh, what other kind of farming is carried on in this state? Well, as you say, we got we got dairy, some canning crops not as large in this area as they used to be. Any success with canning crops? Canning crops, I've never known a farmer to make anything on them yet. Yeah. As they break the farmers in one area, they move on to another. As it stands now, the, the pea production is in Aroostook County. Mm -hmm. It's come all the way up the East Coast. Farmers going broke as they went. Now on the blue, blueberries in the state of Maine, which is probably not known to most people, 80% of the nation's production, low bush blueberries, come from the state of Maine. 80% 80 of the nation's production. Th this is a wild blueberry, yeah. which is quite remarkable because most people don't realize that. NFO has made great gains in the blueberry industry. We signed our first contract last year at two and a half cents over the open market, and they have signed a new contract this year for even larger production at two and a half cents mm -hmm. over last year's contract. Mm -hmm. So this is this is gains that, well, the blueberry industry, the growers wasn't getting anything for their land or anything. All they got was usually just a bill at the end of the year for the harvest and the yes. spraying of the crop. Yes. This way they may realize a little profit this year. Well, now, up and down the East Coast, Don, uh, the consumption of dairy beef is very big, isn't it? Right. They tell me it's 80% uh, on the East Coast is dairy, and dairy beef is preferred. Mm -hmm. yeah, the NFO beef program here in the state of Maine has been working very well in the past year and a half. Local prices was 35 to 37 cents a pound. We have increased them through the NFO sales to where well, they peak 50 cents a pound this year. And this means to the, to the member that is shipping with us 75 to $100 per cow on the average Holstein carcass which is quite a, quite a bit over what it was a year and a half ago. This $75, one, one animal takes care of your dues. Any other uh, outstanding marketing increases uh, through NFO in the states you can think of? Well, I believe the one of the outstanding increases this year was the 34 cent increase in milk over the federal auto minimum. And this is the first time in the history of the industry that they've ever paid more than the minimum price. Mm -hmm. There's only one thing that has brought it up there, and that's NFO contracts in the Midwest. And as it's, I understand now, the closest milk contract to this area is in Vermont now, so it's inching this way very fast. Yes, it is. So I, lo I look for great success in, in the milk industry and all other commodities in this coming year. Is this considered the potato area of the state of Maine, or are we on the southern end of it? Uh, this, is, this is the middle part of the state, and... It's very small potato-wise compared to Rooster County. Now that's what, north of here, is it not? Right. Is that up around, what, Presque Isle and in that area? Yes. Way to the north? Right. About 200 miles north of here. But you have some good-looking potatoes this year. They're just beginning to uh, blossom. The potatoes in this area are, are probably better for potato chips than some other areas. These are chip potatoes? Most generally, yes. yes. What makes a good chip potato, Don? 
Well, I think uh, st storage and weather, mm -hmm. pretty pretty much. They have to have it, keep it under control. Storage. Yeah. And uh, the, the as I say, the climate has is, a lot is, to do. It's just a little bit different down here in Tisman County, right. uh, which helps some. Yeah. Do you have uh, storage facilities for your potatoes? Uh, I don't raise potatoes myself, yeah. but so, uh, but the, most of them do have. Mm -hmm. uh, about, about all potato farmers have some storage. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> in your facilities here, and in your dairy operation, uh, you have an outstanding uh, setup. What do you call this, where the cows uh, are free to roam in the barn, and uh, and they each have a stall where where they can lie down and right. uh, sleep and rest. They don't have much of a a harried life in there, do they? No, they have it pretty soft. All they have to do is eat and sleep. Yeah. Walk into the pile when it comes milk time. This is what is known as the freestall setup. Mm -hmm. I use the herringbone milking pile, which is a double six. It works works pretty fair. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of the manual labor out of it, but if you get bigger, although you're automated, you got to run pretty fast just to keep up the automation. <laughs> And then when you start having breakdowns, it's, yeah. it's even more harried. We've seen a number of milking parlors and dairy setups through New England, and uh, I think that uh, your tank is the biggest one we've seen. What's its capacity? 1,250 gallons. Yeah. This is, uh, was bought with the idea of a little more expansion to mm -hmm. stay in business, which yeah. is, I think, is the wrong way of going about it. I think the NFO way is the best way of getting the price for what you do produce. And then, then we, everybody will be on top. The whole economy will be better off. As I see it, this is the only way to go. And that's this week's report on agriculture in the Northeast, New Jersey, and the state of Maine. U.S. Farm Report is seen on this station each week at this time. Until we meet again, so long, everybody. Mm -hmm.